For a long time, the American dream has been a pillar in our society. It's this idea that if you show up and work hard and do the right thing and stay the course, minus having like major obstacles, you too can elevate yourself and your family to a higher quality of life. And that usually meant finding fulfillment in a job or increasing your financial situation. Uh, For decades, really, since World War II, pretty much up until 2008 when the housing market crashed, the uh, average life script in our country was the American dream. Again, for those who had the ability to run after it. And the American dream for a long time was both simple and accessible. It was this plan, you know, to go to school, get a job, get married, work hard, start a family, get a house, build some wealth, spoil the grandkids, retire nicely, and then you'd be all set. And honestly, like entire generations for a while had great success in this. I did some research and found out that in the 70s, you could live in Manhattan while working at a grocery store. Crazy to think about now, but back then people good, like, and then get a job and kind of grow out of that and they'd be fine and get a house in the Hamptons or something, I don't know. I uh, leveraged some of my journalism skills from back in the day and I went and looked up housing data from Howard County, like in old PDFs. This will be fun for you. I found out 30 years ago that the average household income was $65,000, not bad, and the average home cost $150,000 only. You can't buy a shed in Howard County (laughs) for $150,000 right now. But for a long time, this American dream worked. You know, upward mobility wasn't just possible, it was predictable. Just do the right things, avoid these obstacles, get out of certain situations and things could work. Now, I'm not saying upward mobility isn't possible today. I'm not against that. I'm a big believer in hard work and making wise decisions to honor you and your family for the long term. But today, to be successful that way, it requires countercultural living that deviates from the American norm. And we're actually going to talk about that in a new series we're launching next week. But the promise of the American dream has really been eroding for a lot of people over the last 20 years. And it's become more apparent as my generation, the millennial generation, have become the largest generation in the United States. Because millennials grew up with the promise of the American dream. Our parents taught it to us, they modeled it to us. You know, you go to school, you get a good job, and you save, and and then you can afford a house, and everything works out. But then, we went through a series of global destabilizing events from childhood to now that planted seeds of doubt when it comes to the American dream. Because my generation, we were in middle school or high school when 9-11 happened. And then one year later, we had the DC sniper shooting, which was fun. And then Hurricane Katrina leveled an entire city, which we didn't think was possible. And then while in school, we watched the US enter its first long-term military conflict in the Iraq war in 30 years. Then we graduate college, yay, and the housing market falls apart. The world economy goes to crap. Then we are still in counseling about what social media and smartphones are doing to us. And then COVID-19 in 2020 happens, and the rest is history. And all of this is why we find ourselves in a place where many people have done all the things you're supposed to to pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and yet so many people are miserable. More people than ever are disenchanted now with the American dream and no longer believe in its promises. Sociologists report that young people right now are more hesitant to pursue traditional career paths. They are skeptical of major institutions. They're cynical about their future. They're anxious about the opportunities that they do get, and they're trapped in patterns of consumer debt and school debt. And because of all that, marriages are happening later in life or not at all. Home ownership feels impossible. The Census Bureau put out last year that only 49% of millennials have a retirement savings account. So less than half of all millennials are even saving for the future. Again, we'll talk about that in a new series. People today are having less kids than ever or no kids at all, which is why in 2040, there will be more people in America over the age of 65 than there are under the age of 18. First time in human history. And a decreasing birth rate, um, according to economists, is one of the key factors to predict societal collapse. Aren't you glad you came to church today? What a happy outlook on life. Um, But all of this I share, it's because of all this that people are now abandoning the previous American dream and now uh, pursuing a completely different one. 
one that is less about upward mobility and more about self-actualization and individualism. The new sort of unspoken American dream isn't about building a family or building a future. It's about becoming right now a fully autonomous person, independent from institutions, that has a life personalized to be about you, for you, and created to you, ranging from your career to sexuality to entertainment and even your faith. This new dream comes with a new life script all of its own that a lot of us sort of implicitly start running after. And it comes with like this me, me, me focus about things that are convenient to me and convenient to my boundaries, convenient to my well-being and all these things, convenient to my personhood. And on paper, it sounds really, really nice. But what comes with it is disaster. Because the new American dream is a hyper-individualized life, but it's producing a world of extreme isolation. This new life script is really convenient and it's hyper-individualized, but it's producing a world of extreme isolation. I mentioned this last week, but the U.S. Surgeon General put out a statement in May saying the new epidemic in our world, in America, is not substance abuse or addiction or anxiety. It's loneliness. And he said, quote, widespread loneliness in the U.S. poses health risks as deadly as smoking up to 15 cigarettes a day. And the foundation for all of these negative things I'm talking about it didn't just happen during COVID. It was laid well before 2020, but 2020 accelerated everything. And it's true when you think about our lives. We are enticed more than ever to automate and personalize and segment our lives. And so things are really convenient for us right now, but we are more isolated than ever. Think about your life. You don't call other people to give you a ride. You call Uber. Uh, you don't go out and shop and talk to a salesperson. You just go on Amazon. You don't go to the library, you stay home and have the book sent to you. You don't have a local barista. You have a phone and you place an order and you walk inside and you grab your th uh, drink and you go inside not to be bothered unless they get it wrong and then you make a scene. <laughs> you know, you still go to stores, but then you pull up to the curb and pop up the trunk and some rando throws it in. No one makes eye contact and then you pull off and you got what you need. You know, we have food delivered to our front door. We have playlists tailored to our exact taste. We have YouTube curated to our worldview. And we're able to follow or mute people based on a single click of a button. And none of this includes how this new paradigm is affecting sex and romance and our most intimate connections with other people. This new life script that we're all swimming in distances us from others. We are programmed now to pursue pleasure and convenience instead of what's meaningful and uncomfortable, and it is dehumanizing us. It dehumanizes the value of your everyday life. And if you don't believe me, again, just think about your life for a second. I'll be the guinea pig. I know I'm not the only one who has a neighbor whose name I should know, but I forgot, and now I avoid conversations with them so I don't get exposed for not knowing their name. I'm going to take your uncomfortable silence as affirmation that this is true for you. <laughs> I know I'm not the only one who gets disproportionately angry when someone in the self-checkout line is taking too long, and I just need to get out of here because I see people as a nuisance instead of a neighbor. I know I'm not the only one. When the doorbell rings, you jump up like there's a burglar or some salesperson you have to get out of here because it is so foreign to us to actually have someone ring the doorbell and knock and say hello for once. We are guinea pigs in a new human experiment, and we're running after a new dream that plays to our worst impulses because it makes us less interruptible and more isolated than ever. And here's my conviction. This modern life script is a disaster for the average person, and it is a cancer for followers of Christ. It is a disaster for the average person, and it's a cancer for those of us that want to follow Jesus well. We are more isolated and less connected really than ever, even though we have technology. This life script creates people who have impatient lives, who live predictable days, and have unadventurous experiences who live out powerless faith. Because the average person is conditioned to be relationally empty right now. The average Christian is groomed to be spiritually impotent, and the entire world is headed toward emotional and spiritual decay, and we just have to pretend this is the way it's supposed to be. See, the goal of the church is to be a city on a hill. And our mission at Mosaic is to seek and save the lost, to engage people with the hope of Jesus. But how do you do that in this new American paradigm? How do you be church for people who don't go to church when our world is more open to spirituality but less open to church in general? 
I go on Instagram and I see people who are more confident in the energy of crystals and nature than they are the historical evidence for the life and resurrection of Jesus. How do you minister to people in this climate? Like, how do you really invite people to God's welcoming love and exclusive truth through Christ in this dynamic? An author I have come to love uh, and admire uh, put our tension this way. She said, let's face it, we've become unwelcome guests in this post-Christian world. Our children ride their scooters in neighborhoods where conservative Christianity is dismissed or denounced as irrelevant, irrational, discriminatory, and dangerous. Many of us go to work in places where sensitivity training has become an Orwellian nightmare. Christian common sense is declared hate speech by the new keepers of this culture. The old rules don't apply anymore. Many Christians genuinely do not know what to say to their unbelieving neighbors. The language and the logic have changed almost overnight. And because of this, many Christians don't know what to do. So they either isolate themselves from the world and move off to a far land and say, I don't, I'm just going to make my own bubble, which is unbiblical, or they edit Jesus to make him more politically correct and palatable to people, which is just lying about how Jesus presented himself. But the good news for us is there's a third way, that there's a detour away from this American paradigm that we find in Jesus It's a practice that transcends time and trends that can help you and I live a life of freedom, a life of truth, a life of meeting, and a life of invitation that impacts the people around us. So today, as we conclude this series, I'm personally going to deviate and do a detour of my own away from the life of Joseph that we've been reading and look at a biography of Jesus called the Gospel of Luke found in the New Testament. And in it, we're going to see Jesus model a way forward for us as he faced very similar dynamics that you and I, as Christians, are following today. So let's just jump right in here. Luke 19, verse 1. It says, Jesus entered Jericho, a city, and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd, hashtag short kings. So, he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass by. When Jesus came, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord, and if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the son of man, referring to himself, came to seek and save those who are lost. Now, This might sound like just a nice story. You know, isn't it great Jesus came and hung out with Zacchaeus? That's so nice. He did such a good thing. But if you were in the audience witnessing these events, uh, you would have considered much of this dangerous because it was a massive disruption to the status quo of people's expectations of Jesus and who you did or did not have a meal with. And and here are really two reasons why this was such a dangerous scene um, in the ancient Jewish world. First off, Zacchaeus was a tax collector. You know, he kind of said, like, if I've wronged anyone, it was guaranteed he wronged people. Being a tax collector back then meant you were a tax exploiter. He was the worst of the worst in Jewish society. He was a Jew himself who made a living collecting taxes from their oppre- for their oppressors, the Roman Empire, but then he would upcharge his Jewish neighbors to fatten his own pockets. So Zacchaeus was a traitor and scum to the Jewish people but he is the one who Jesus chooses to have a meal with. And it's really hard to overstate how big of a deal this was. Like, it would be like Jesus showing up and walking around today and then choosing to sit down with like the top drug dealer of West Baltimore and having a meal. Or it'd be like him saying, yeah, let's get brunch with the woman who makes all of her money on OnlyFans and he would allow her to pay for it with money that she made selling her body for sex to a faceless online audience. Like, you know how all societies have moral ladders and they kind of fit people in them? Zacchaeus was at the bottom of this ladder. He was despicable. He was viewed as deplorable. Like, they could not have imagined a scenario where a rabbi of the Jewish law would ever give this person any time or attention. 
It would be like Jesus today sitting down for dinner with a registered sex offender. Like, we could not and would not understand that. People would be livid and would want to pick it outside of that meal. But on top of all this, Zacchaeus was likely incredibly isolated and lonely. His very oppression ensured that he was ostracized by the Jews, but because he was a Jew, he wasn't accepted by the Romans. So he was likely isolated all the time and had to leverage all his money just to have some friendships. But in the strategy of Jesus, in this man's loneliness and isolation and rejection, we see him draw close to someone around a dinner table. The scene was dangerous to the people who observed it because of the fact he was a tax collector. And number two, it was dangerous because sharing a meal back then meant way more than it does to you and I. Meals in ancient times were a sign of exclusivity. Uh, Who you didn't eat with was just as important as who you chose to dine with. So uh, you wouldn't share a meal with anyone unless they were family or someone you deeply approved of. It's kind of like Friendsgiving when you're in your 20s, you know? And, you know, you kind of evaluate people all year to see if they get invited, and if they make it, they're on the roster for next year's friendships. And then at the next Friendsgiving, you find out who made the cut, and you kind of go from there. It's kind of like that. But in Jewish culture, sharing a meal was the same as being in deep friendship with them. It was also an act of worship. To eat with someone, it was like you and me are in unity, and God's in unity, and we're all in this together. So it was a huge deal. There was a massive difference between how they approached dining together and how we do. But there's also a major difference between how Jesus picked people to eat and drink with versus how the religious elites did the same thing. One theologian even said, Jesus got himself killed because of the people he ate with. Now, I gotta get nerdy on this for a moment, and it's gonna make sense, it's gonna add value to us, so stay with me. In verse 10 of our story, Jesus says, for the Son of Man, and he introduces himself in that phrase. That language is really, really important because the only other time we hear Jesus do this in the book of Luke is at another meal in Luke 7. But in that meal, he's meeting with the religious elite, and then a prostitute shows up. She breaks perfume all over his feet to wash his feet with her hair and her own tears, and then Jesus honors her for her hospitality in the presence of all these highly religious men. And in verse 34 of that story, he says, the Son of Man, referring to himself again, feasts and drinks. And you say he's a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and other sinners, but wisdom is shown to be right by the lives of those who follow it. So here's where all this comes together. When we hear Jesus say son of man in the story of Zacchaeus, he is revealing something about his mission. He's speaking about his mission to seek and save the lost. And when he says son of man in another story with the meal, with the prostitute, Christ is revealing his method. He shares his mission and his method when he introduces this name. And his method was to drink with sinners so they might encounter the welcoming love of God. See, seeking and saving the lost is Christ's mission, and sharing a meal was his method. And these stories of Jesus eating and drinking with sinners, and when I say drinking, I don't mean shot, 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 shots, okay? Like, (laughs) don't get a DUI and tell the cop, my pastor told me to. I am not saying that. I'm off the hook. What I mean is literally eating and drinking with people, and when Jesus did this, it wasn't the exception to his ministry. It was the norm. Sharing a meal with other people was the standard by which he would engage the people around him. There are more than 50 references to Jesus and food in the Gospel of Luke alone. One author said this, in Luke's Gospel, Jesus is either going to a meal, at a meal, or coming from a meal. That's my kind of guy. I like that. (laughs) So, we live in an increasingly isolated world. Mental health is way down. Spiritual openness is way up. We're at a crossroads of what human flourishing looks like. People are languishing in the uncertainty and the anxiety and the lack of control that they sense over their world. They're doing all the right things prescribed by the American dream, but nothing's working out. And then we see the chief strategy of Jesus to address loneliness and rejection and the ache in someone's heart and the sin in their life was to get them around a table and to eat and dine with them. 
And it's why I believe God is calling us as a church to take a detour from this new American dream of convenience and individualized living and open ourselves up to be people who participate in Christ's message, message by mission, sorry, who participate in Christ's mission by adopting his method. Just like many Christians today, Jesus had a lot of people who didn't like him for his ideas. A lot of people who didn't understand him or who just assumed the worst about him. But his answer to cultural hostility was radically ordinary hospitality. His answer to cultural hostility was radically ordinary hospitality. In order to engage in increasingly post-Christian world and the hostility that comes with it, we must learn to adopt the ancient practice of Jesus. That is radically ordinary hospitality. When people ask, how did Jesus reach so many people? You know, in a world of suspicion and pride and violence, the answer is one meal at a time. See, for 15 years, we as a church have said, come and see. Uh, We've positioned ourselves on Sundays to set up great environments and to be a resource for you so that when you connect with friends, you invite them to come and see this Jesus that's changing your life. And through the environments we have here, the grace of God gets magnified. We see people get baptized. It's incredible. And we are always going to do that. Jesus taught his disciples to say, come and see, bring them to me, and I will change them. That's what we do on Sundays. But what Jesus also did was model what it meant to go and show. And his invitation to us at Mosaic is to embrace the radical power of ordinary hospitality, to resist the pull of a hyper-individualized life and live on mission to serve others while also having great environments where we say, come and see. And the time for us to grow in this is now. The Barner Group is a Christian research center, much like the Pew Research Center, And last quarter, they reported 91% of Americans believe in or are open to the idea of a spiritual dimension. 77% of Americans believe in God or a higher power, and 74% say they would like to grow spiritually. But most telling of all, 44% of people are more open to God today than they were before the COVID-19 pandemic. This is the spiritual climate we inhabit But modern life keeps you and me away from even being around people. It resists our, like, God-given desire to get around folks and just covers us with convenience so we're not even able to, like, speak into and care for people who are in this spiritual state. See, the detour that Jesus is inviting us into, and I'll get into specifics in a moment, is to push back against this conditioning and to subversively protest the isolation of our time and leverage our homes and our relationships as ground zero for Christ's mission and his method. And the best part about this invitation is that it doesn't come with like uncomfortable, churchy, evangelical tricks that many of us are allergic to. It's not about a trick, it's about a table. Viewing your teammates and your coworkers and your neighbors and your friends who don't know Christ, not as problems or projects, but as people. In the Greek, the word hospitality is a compound word that means to love the stranger or the other or the outsider. It was displaying God's welcoming love through offering shelter and some food and giving people the things that we value the most, our time and our budget and our attention. So the hard thing about following Jesus sometimes is that he calls us to what he calls us to, especially when it's difficult to culture. But this is the invitation that he's offering us here at Mosaic. We are commanded throughout Scripture to partner with Christ in his mission, but also adopt his method. It's all over the New Testament. Here's Romans 12. Always be eager to practice hospitality. 1 Peter, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. I love the without grumbling part because it proves the Bible's real. Uh, How many of you have been like, stay as long as you want, and inside you're like, they better leave by nine so I can watch an episode before I go to bed. It's like, yeah, yeah, have another one. It's like, no, I don't have anything to drink the rest of the week. Okay. (laughs) Everyone who's ever been over to my house is like, oh. (laughs) That's why he put everything away. Okay, there we go. I'm a little cheap. I'm a little cheap. It's okay. (sighs) Throughout Scripture, though, um, hospitality is not just a nice thing to do. It's, an requir- it's a requirement to be a leader in the church. And that's why it's such a, a big deal today 
It's why we as a church model that. If you want to be a leader or an elder in the church, you must be someone who is committed to modeling hospitality because it was a primary method of Christ's way of accomplishing his mission. And men, I want to talk to you specifically for a moment. Hospitality is not a woman's thing. It's a leadership thing, okay? It is not a woman's issue. It is a leadership issue. Men in the New Testament who are exalted for their leadership and for their influence are called that because they are men who were praised for showing hospitality. And if you are a man, the call in your life is to lead and provide and protect for your family. And one of the key testaments of that leadership is how well you are hospitable to the people God has entrusted to be in your sphere of influence. And hear me, this isn't about fancy dinner plates and mood lighting. It's not about being a good cook or even having a table. Shout out to all the bachelors who eat their dinner on TV trays. I've been there. This is about leadership. It's about stepping into a world of hostility and animosity and being like Jesus, leveraging hospitality and using authentic connection to bridge the gap of your own fears so that God can use you and maybe pull people out of the isolation and loneliness of our time by you leading well and creating a space to be hospitable to others. I quoted that author earlier, Rosaria Butterfield, in part because her life was changed by a man who did this very thing. Watch this. I was raised in an Italian family. There were some issues in my house that made it almost impossible to have people in. So hospitality didn't really become endemic to my life until I had set up a home of my own. I was a professor at Syracuse. I lived as an out lesbian feminist in New York. In our LGBTQ community, somebody's home was open every night of the week. And there was never a question, where will I go if I need help? Because the community itself is organic and fluid, and that was how we dealt with crises. After I wrote my tenure book, I really wanted to write a book that was on my heart. Why is the religious right such a hateful community? And why do they hate people like me? I was on a war against two things, patriarchy and stupid. So I was really curious to know why relatively decent people would use the Bible in such a hateful way. So I wrote an editorial and it brought all kinds of attention my way, which I didn't really expect, but one of the things it brought my way was a letter from Ken Smith, the pastor of the Syracuse Reformed Presbyterian Church. When Ken and his wife Floyd invited me to dinner, I, I was happy. I, th I thought of Ken as my unpaid research assistant. And they were fine with the fact that I, I wanted to read the Bible to critique it. That began a research journey that changed my life. But it wasn't research that changed my life. In Ken and Floyd's home, the way that they practiced hospitality became a living, breathing example of the theology that they were teaching. After my first dinner at Ken and Floyd's house, Ken gave me a big hug, Floyd gave me a big hug and a kiss on the cheek. We said, we'll catch up next week, this was fun, can't wait to do it again. They did not share the gospel with me and they did not invite me to church. And that was so wonderful, because what it showed to me was that they didn't see me as a project. They actually saw me as a neighbor. Now, I didn't step foot in the church for two years, but every week I was in their home. And every week, it was clear that pretty much anything could go. We could ask anything, Ken and Floyd were fine. And that process of dialogue and table fellowship was compelling. It was deeply compelling. I did not come to faith because I stopped feeling like a lesbian. It's not that I got all of my worldview issues just completely cemented with a happy Christian evangelism, not at all. I came to faith because I became convicted that Jesus is who he says he is. Ephesians 4.29 is our watchword, that we are to impart grace to the hearer. I might not agree with everything that you hold to be near and dear, but because we are neighbors, I don't have to say everything that's on my heart. 
And you don't have to say everything that's on your heart right now. We can put some of our worldview issues aside. And over years of this, the gospel takes on a momentum that is compelling to people. I think we need to give each other the reminder that it's God who saves. It's not about certainly us being perfect or our words being perfect. But show up, we must, in the lives of unbelievers. What comes naturally to me and what comes naturally to you is to hang out with people who are like us. <laughs> people who can maybe finish our sentences, people who don't scare us. But hospitality, biblically speaking, takes strangers and makes them neighbors. It takes neighbors and makes them family of God. It's a great joy to see the gospel bring people together who are supposed to be enemies. And it's a great joy to know that God never gets the address wrong. And if your neighbors aren't people you know yet, there's a blessing waiting for you. Yeah, that's great. Rosaria was a lesbian feminist critical theory scholar. Uh, I spoke with her recently, and she told me she was a tenured radical hell-bent on deconstructing the fallacy of Christianity and finding why Christians were so hateful and terrible. She was the exact opposite of what you would call a primary candidate to come to put their faith in Christ. But through radically ordinary hospitality with real, raw, open Jesus followers, her life and more importantly, her eternity was changed forever. Listen, don't for a second think I'm talking about all this because I'm good at this. I suck at this. Uh, but I'm leading us into this because God has been at work on me and convicting me. Because honestly, more days than not, I drive home and I see a neighbor outside and in my head I'm thinking, please don't talk to me, please don't talk to me, please don't talk to me. I want to go inside. I'm going from my paid job to my unpaid job as a father and a husband and this house is chaos. I got three small kids. Just let me get inside, please. Like, just don't talk to me. And yeah, boundaries aren't bad. It's important to have boundaries. But that mindset of being closed off is sin. I am sinning when I view people as problems or projects that I have to get past instead of being the image bearers of God that he has entrusted to be in my sphere. That is not the way of Jesus and not the way he treated people. And the tendency that we all have to interpret the world through convenience is sin in my life. And I know I'm not the only one. This modern life script is a disaster for the average person and it is a cancer for the follower of Christ. And God wants us to do something about it. So that's why this fall we will be leaning into this practice of radically ordinary hospitality as a church through a special initiative we're launching called Tables. Our goal is to mobilize our church together to host 1,000 tables throughout the four months of the fall so we can resist the tide of culture and take bold steps to know our neighbors, engage our friends and our coworkers, to be hospitable to the people in our lives, especially those who don't yet follow Jesus. Now, when I say tables, some of you are already writing yourself off because you're like, I can't cook, I don't have a table, my house is a mess, I have young kids. Good news for you is, for you, none of that matters. None of that matters. All a table is, is an intentional gathering time with people you'll be intentional with where your goal is to be hospitable with them in a way that's normal and regular for you, and that'll be different per person, and your only goal here is to pray before people show up, to be present with them during, and be patient with God as he takes control of their story of life change instead of you. The goal here isn't that they'd come to a table and then come to church the next week. We're playing the long game here of being light in a dark world and being hospitable the way Jesus was. It's about setting a, like a metaphorical table for God to move through the relationships he's already given you, to go and show the grace and truth of Jesus with people so that maybe one day they might say yes when you tell them to come and see. And it's easy to do this. It's gotta be normal and regular for you. It's as easy as hosting a cookout in your driveway and inviting some of the neighbors to pop in. 
It could be doing a monthly hang with your indoor soccer team and just inviting them over and stepping into that time with a little bit more presence than normal to see how God is at work in their life and how he wants you to speak to them. It could be as fancy as a big Thanksgiving dinner with your neighbors and it could be as simple as Doritos and Mountain Dew with some friends on a Friday game night, hashtag bachelor pad, all right, that works. And I know you've got a lot of questions uh, and I'm intentionally focusing today on the why, not the what, but right now, if you know that God is poking at you and nudging you to take a step of faith and host a table or just get encouraged to learn how to actually do that, I want you to scan this QR code and just let us know that you want more info or that you're in and you're gonna give it a shot. This is the beginning step to get in the pipeline so we can enable you to go host a table, one, two, three, or many. Last service, I talked to a guy who lives in West Baltimore who had been sensing God wanted him to start just making coffee on Saturdays and giving it to neighbors. He said, I've been putting it off for months and I'm gonna start. Another woman told me that she works from home and right around 3.30, all these teenagers come out of school and they bother her and she's like, I need to leave ice pops out for them and just let them know that I see them as image bearers of God and as people, not as problems in my life. God is already stirring this in some of us, and so I'm just nudging the momentum of what he's already doing in our church. Our staff already, each staff member has committed to doing four this fall. Why four? Because it's kinda easy. September, fall time. October, Halloween. Thanksgiving's November, and then you got Christmas in December. The season sets you up really nicely. And I know for some, just doing one is gonna be a big step. But that's why faith is spelled R-I-S-K. What scares you may not scare me, but that's what following Jesus requires of us, to take steps that are intimidating. And my big challenge is that you would take a risk to take a detour from the typical American dream, perhaps even a detour of what you think your fall was supposed to look like, and open up your life as Jesus commanded, to be interruptible to participate in the work of God so that maybe, just maybe, he reaches people like Rosaria who you'd never think would come and taste the goodness of God. I was casting vision about all this a couple months ago to our board of overseers. They're the men who pray and protect our church. They, they do a good job of uh, just providing wisdom and, and caring for this team and holding me accountable and all those things. Um, but after casting vision to the team, one of the men, uh, men on this team, David Ross, um, decided he was gonna start doing prayer walks in his neighborhood. It's like prepare his heart for getting to know neighbors and talking to them and all that stuff. And he's an incredible man of God and faithful leader, loves his wife, loves the church. So we're at lunch a couple months ago. He's telling me about the step that he took to pray. And he tells me, he goes out, he's like, God, tell me, you know, what should I be praying for? I wanna listen to you, I wanna know people I don't know, just tell me what to pray. And after a couple moments, he told me that he felt God was telling him to repent. And he's like, repent? Like, I'm out here praying. Like, I'm, I'm doing the thing you told me to do. Like, wh- what are you talking about, repent? And I was confused too. But then David said to me, God was telling me to repent because I've never cared about my neighborhood until now. He said, God was telling me to repent because it took me this long to pray for the people on my block. And when he told me that, I was like, dang, me too. Me too, man. See, if you don't follow Jesus, I don't expect you to host a table. I don't expect you to agree with me on all the things that I said were problems. You might be like, I like not having to leave my house. I get it. But what I do want you to know is if you don't follow Jesus, you too have a seat at the table with him. The sin that you think disqualifies you or the doubt that you think he can't overcome, I had that too. And I learned that Jesus had a place for me at his table and his grace is free and available to all who believe. It requires something of us, but it's not about you being good. It's about you trusting in what he did for you on the cross. And so if you're someone who's here and you've been living that life script and you know this is not what you were made to do, and you know that God is calling you home to trust Jesus, even in your questions, I want you to check the baptism box in your connection card. We will call you this week about what does it mean to give your life to Christ, to walk with him and experience unity with him. One of the big reasons we're doing this is because people are more lonely than ever. And people, the stats show, are more open to the search for meaning in their life and the search for God. And so we as a church, we're not better than anyone. We're just broken vessels pointing to the person who can give eternal life, and that's Jesus Christ. And because we have that gift, we also have the burden of making sure that people around us know this. In a world of hostility, the way forward is radically ordinary hospitality. So scan the QR code 
even as I pray, if you're like, I'm scared, but I wanna say yes. And let's see what God does in us and through us this fall. Let's pray. God, you know I uh, drive home from work and I've known this is coming and I get like a pit in my stomach because I'm like, I really don't wanna do this. <laughs> I'd much rather just sit at home and uh, have my own little bubble and be fine. Um, but Jesus, you call us to something so much richer, so much better, so much more fulfilling, so much more impactful. So God, I pray we would have the courage to say yes, even in our questions, and we would begin to see our world the way you do, with openness and interruptibility, and with intention, so that people like Rosaria and many others that we know, who maybe we've written off, would come to see that you are good and that you lead to eternal life. Jesus, I pray these things in your name. Amen. Thank you.